Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. Before we begin today's episode, I'd like to take a moment to talk about dogs. Dogs have been an important part of Canadian history from the very beginning. The first dogs to arrive in Canada came from Siberia over 12,000 years ago. They were used for hunting, pulling sleds, and as companions for the indigenous people who made their way across the Bering Strait. In the 17th century, European settlers brought dogs with them as well. And like the indigenous people, they relied on their dogs for companionship, hunting, and protection. Dogs have been some of Canada's most beloved heroes. In 1909, a Labrador retriever named Polar Bear helped the explorer Robert Perry reach the North Pole. In 1916, Canadians were captivated by the story of Bruno, a sheepdog who was rescued from war-torn Europe and refused to eat after his person passed away. In 1941, a Newfoundland named Gander saved the lives of several Canadian soldiers during the Battle of Hong Kong. Over the centuries, dogs have served Canadians in an ever-expanding variety of ways. Today, they work in law enforcement, detect cancer and COVID, help find missing children, and enable the blind to get around. But for most Canadians, dogs are much more than just working animals. Their loyalty, friendship, and unconditional love have made them part of our families. Countless dogs are beloved characters in Canadian art and film. Their stories have been told by such noteworthy authors as Farley Mowat, Lucy Maud Montgomery, and Stephen Leacock. They can make us laugh, they comfort us, they remind us of our better angels, of what our character could be, and perhaps that is why we love them so much. Which brings me to my puppy, Boris. Boris is a 10-year-old Irish setter, Newfoundland Cross, the same breed as Gander, actually. Recently, he began hacking up his food. His bark became raspy, and he's having trouble breathing deeply, so I took him to see the vet. Boris has the canine version of Lou Gehrig's disease. His spinal cord will slowly degenerate, and over the next one to three years, he will progressively lose control of the muscles he uses to play, bark, eat, and breathe. There is no cure, and the cause remains unknown. But there is a way to slow it down. With the laryngeal paralysis, Boris needs surgery. Without it, his constricted larynx will get worse faster, and he may pass away in only a few months. The problem is the surgery costs $5,000, which is well beyond what I can afford. So I'm asking for your help. I've set up a GoFundMe to pay for the vet. If you'd like to contribute, just click the link for Boris Fundraiser in my show notes. And if you've donated already, thank you. If you've shared, thank you as well. Thank you for helping us get a few more precious years together, because it means the world to us both. Long before Europeans arrived in the area of Langham, it was the land occupied primarily by the Stony Cree people, as well as the northern reaches of the Sioux and the eastern reaches of the Blackfoot. The area was highly sought after by the indigenous as it had a great deal of flora and fauna that helped the indigenous throughout the seasons. It was also the northern reaches for the bison who migrated to the area in the summer. Eventually, the Métis would begin to arrive from the east as European settlers started to push in from the east during the 19th century. Today, Langham sits on Treaty 6 land. The town of Langham was first settled in 1904 when the Canadian Northern Railway was built through, running from Saskatoon to Edmonton. This helped spur on the development in the area as new Canadians began to arrive to take up homesteads in the area. The area was primarily settled by Mennonites, and the community would be named for E. Langham, who was a purchasing agent for the railway company. A long bridge was built across the nearby North Saskatchewan River in the winter of 1904-05, helping settlers cross the river without crossing the ice or using the ferry in the spring. And the community quickly began to grow, and in 1906 it was declared a village. One year later, it was incorporated as a town. The first mayor of the community was A.C. Admondson. Langham was described as the first point of importance on the Winnipeg to Vancouver Yellow Trail after leaving Saskatoon. By the mid-1920s, the production of crops in the area amounted to an excellent 1.2 million bushels of wheat and a slightly smaller amount of grains, oats, and barley. 
1921, a four-room school was built in Langham at a cost of $33,000, or about $520,000 today. This school was needed due to the rising population of children, and it was built with all the modern conveniences, with brick and tile to ensure proper fireproof construction. It also had steam, heat, and electric lighting with a full-sized basement. I want to talk about the Local History Atlas. This was created by one of my listeners, Ben Woodward, and it's fantastic. It's this wonderful website where you can see a, a Google Maps image of Canada, and you can visit all of the places in Canada. And within these places are my local history podcast episodes that you can listen to. And one of the great things about it is you can add to it. You can put your own pictures in. You can put your own information. It's creating this wonderful historical mosaic of Canada. And it's a wonderful website. Uh, I have the link in my show notes. But if you also want to visit yourself, it's atlas.digitalhistory.ca. And we can create this wonderful mosaic of Canada's history. All of us, you can learn about Canada's history. If you're going on a road trip, you can use this wonderful site to see where you're going and the amazing things that you can see. So be sure to check it out. One interesting fact about Langham is that it has one of the highest number of churches per capita in all of Canada. Within the community of 1,500 people, there is a Catholic Church, a United Church, a Mennonite Church, an Evangelical Bible Church, a Lutheran Church, and a Country Church. There is a unique story related to one person from Langham. The first Allied soldier to cross the Bonn Bridge into Germany after the armistice of November 1918 would be Garnet Durham of Regina, a member of the Canadian Cyclist Battalion. Another cyclist received the surrender from the German Imperial family, although if this happened, it's actually up for debate. According to the story, a group of cyclists were in Mons when Prince Frederick arrived as part of the treaty signing party. He saw Jacques Farquois from Langham and mistook him for an Allied official. He handed over his sword as a symbolic sign of surrender. Did it happen? Well, who knows, but it makes a good story. I'd like to take a break away from the episode for a second to talk about ExploreNet. I spent most of my life living in rural areas in Canada, and I remember the days of dial-up internet and spotty high-speed service. For the past three years, I have been a customer of ExploreNet, and I can honestly say that it is the best rural internet I have ever had. My job as a podcaster means I spend a lot of time researching online, interviewing people over Zoom, and uploading content. Through it all, ExploreNet has provided me with excellent service. When I'm not working, I enjoy streaming content on several streaming platforms and even doing some online gaming with a friend in Ontario. ExploreNet allows me to do all of that with ease. Right now, they offer up to 50 megabits per second on their new LTE network with unlimited data. Their service has only become faster and better since I first signed on. Today and beyond, ExploreNet is investing in building and upgrading the network at a rapid pace. ExploreNet is rural, and that is their route, and that is their focus. For more information about rural internet options in your area, go to ExploreNet.com or call 1-866-285-2253. In 1925, the Halcyonia School was built as a one-room schoolhouse to replace the school that had burned to the ground earlier that year. The new school would become not only a school, but an important gathering place, and many meetings and picnics would be held there. The school would be closed in 1967, but the building would not be torn down or moved. Instead, it would become a community center, lasting until the early 1990s, when the cooperative that ran the center was dissolved due to declining membership. Since then, the school has become a place where artifacts from the schooling history of the community are now on display. In the original school that burned down, John Diefenbaker attended grade 7. His uncle, Edward Diefenbaker, was also the teacher at the school. Diefenbaker would, of course, go on to serve in Parliament from 1940 to 1979, during which time he was the Prime Minister of Canada from 1957 to 1963. On March 15, 1933, Langham became famous for an arrow sled. This snowbird, as it was nicknamed, was designed by J.F. Hawkins of Langham, who made a trip to Saskatoon in the machine, which garnered a lot of local interest. The machine had been built in the garage of C.P. Epp, and it used a 60-horsepower motor from a Ford A engine mounted high on the back of a three-runner sled 
with a six-foot airplane propeller attached to a crankshaft. While the snow was six feet deep in the area of Langham during the winter, the machine was able to travel at 65 kilometers an hour over the snow, reaching Saskatoon in an hour and a half. Hawkins was a pilot for Great West Airways and had been interested in designing his own plane, which led to the creation of the Snowbird. He enjoyed traveling over the unbroken snow, and that inspired him to create the device. The Saskatoon Star Phoenix wrote, quote, Although apparently bulky, the aerosled can turn in its own length and pick up speed quickly. It is driven in the same way as a car, but travels more speedily on packed snow. It can travel on loose snow through a considerably reduced speed. End quote. In July 1933, five Dukabor women, who were members of the Sons of Freedom, disrobed near the CP Ferry to the west of Langham as a protest demonstration. The incident naturally caused a stir in the community, and the women were promptly arrested by the RCMP and held at the Langham Town Hall. At the same time the women conducted their nude protest, a morning march by the Duke of Borth in the community was held. Held in the town hall, the women sang through the night. The Saskatoon Star Phoenix reported, quote, Throughout the night, the five entertained, or otherwise the residents of Langham, with their singing striking the organ effect of minor harmony, which is peculiar to the sect, end quote. Langham made nationwide news in July 1961 when a mystery erupted following a barn fire. Fire crews were going through the rubble of the barn fire and were surprised to find a body amid the rubble. An investigation was launched and it was believed it was James Morton Simpson, a 32-year-old man who worked at the local service station and had been missing since around the time of the fire. A farmer who passed the area also saw Simpson's car near the barn. A shotgun was also found near the body in the barn. An autopsy was conducted but was inconclusive if the body was that of Simpson. After an inquest and more investigation was conducted, it was determined that it was indeed the body of James Simpson, who had died by suicide. The gunshot likely caused the fire in the barn as well. Langham, like other communities across Canada during our centennial year in 1967, decided to spend money on a centennial project. For Langham, the community decided to spend $30,000 to build a new community arena. It was the hope that building a new arena would make Langham a winter sports centre for the area. The rink was also badly needed, as Langham only had an open-air skating rink and a curling rink, and nothing else for winter sports. If you'd like to learn more about the history of Langham, then you should visit the Langham and District Heritage Village and Museum. Occupying the former CNR station that served the community for so many decades, the museum is full of artifacts from the town's history. There is also the Peace Pole, which is outside the building and has writing in English, Norwegian, and Cree. The museum is also home to the Buttercup Betty, which was a wooden milking cow used to demonstrate how to milk cows by hand to early pioneers to the area. I hope you enjoyed that rather short episode of the History of Langham. If you did, please leave a rating and review. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. As well, again, if you want to support the podcast, you can for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash CanadaEHX. And you can donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking donate. And I also want to thank all of my wonderful patrons. And I apologize if I get any names incorrect. Martin Strache, Sarah White, Tom McMillan, Mike Sullivan, Wendy Mills, Keelan Prignitz, Michael Matthews, Joanna Parker, Jeff Dahl, Vobbs, Robert Page, Richard T., Colin Johnson, Jeff Hershey, Kyle Murray, Steve Pakin, Matthew Gartho, Lionel Romaine, Dr. Bob Turner, Randy Hayden, Doug Campbell, Reg W., Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Nixon Ree, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Shove, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Roy, Luke S., J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.